purchase it, and Alan will be happy to sign it for you also. It's about 150 years of um, Livermore and the railroad and that relationship. So, Alan, thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, first of all, let me apologize and say I'm taking rain checks on all kisses, hugs, and handshakes. And if my voice sounds a little bit like a bagpipe, it's because I have a Scottish cold. <laughs> um, this year is a very special year for the town of Livermore. This is the 150th anniversary of the founding of Livermore. It's also the 150th anniversary of the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, which came through Livermore. Gee, what a coincidence. <laughs> and it's actually more than just a coincidence, and we'll start talking about that. Okay, as most of you know, Robert Livermore started a ranch, oh, in the 1830s, sometime in the 1840s. It was uh, granted by the Mexican government, and it was a Mexican land grant. And uh, he ranched the area until 1858 when he died. But there was already a survey of the railroad coming through. In the 1840s, there was a guy named uh, Whitney, Asa Whitney. He was a New York businessman. He went to China by boat to buy Chinese products. And it was a two-year trip there and back. He spent maybe a month or two of those two years uh, doing business, but the rest of the time was in a ship. And during that time, he said, gee, wouldn't it be nice if we had a railroad to the West Coast, to the Pacific Coast? And he drew this map. And you can see there's a line on the map that he drew right there. He had no idea what the country was like. Uh, and he had another problem. None of the West Coast belonged to the United States <laughs> at that time. So Congress ignored him. A few years later... Excuse me, could you move back a bit or over to the side? Oh, oh sure. Thank you. All right. You see better. Okay. A few years later, by 1853, we had both the Treaty of Hidalgo and Mexico that gave the United States the southern portion of the Pacific Coast and an agreement with Britain for the northern section, for the Oregon Coast. And all of a sudden, it, it was realized in Congress, and the President realized, that in order to hold the nation together, we needed a railroad to the Pacific Coast. And so Congress authorized a survey for a railroad. And it was Secretary of War Jefferson Davis who was put in charge of that survey. Uh, there were five different routes that were suggested, and this is the map that was given to the uh, to the lieutenants in the military, in the army, to survey these routes. And uh, there's a route there, one here, and one down here by the Mexican border. And all of those routes got surveyed, and eventually all of those routes got built out. But for the first railroad, there was quite a bit of controversy as to which one to build. Uh, Grenville Dodge wanted the central route across Nebraska because he owns some property in the area. A Senate, Senator Thomas Hart Benton wanted a southern route. And Benton and Davis lobbied for a southern route. Uh, but because of the north-south bickering, nothing got done until the secession. Once the south seceded, uh, Once the South seceded, Lincoln made the decision to take the central route. 
and the route that came through Livermore. And this was a sketch uh, drawn by the survey team that came through Livermore, camped on Livermore's property, and determined that <coughs> Livermore's Pass was the best dry land route from the Central Valley to the Bay Area. We now call that pass the Altamont. Uh, that little inset shows you can still recognize the lumps of which hill is which. And uh, so a couple of years later, Robert Livermore sold an easement to a Francis O'Byrne for five dollars. Oh. <laughs> okay, for a 400 foot wide easement across its property for a railroad with the caveat that it had to be started within two years. That's an interesting caveat, it'll come up again later. Okay, uh, Lincoln and Dodge had already agreed on which route they wanted even before the secession. And so once the secession occurred, uh, Lincoln passed the Pacific Railroad Act. It was not called the Transcontinental Railroad, it was called the Pacific Railroad. And the important thing about the act was that they offered incentives to the builders of dollars per mile that increased with the difficulty of the terrain they were building on. And there were bonds, they were basically loans that had to be paid off in 30 years at 6% interest. And they also gave them alternate sections of land for 10 miles either side of the railroad. They also specified the standard gauge. At that time, the railroads were all different widths. The track widths were different. Uh, the four feet, eight and a half inches was the predominant gauge in the north. There was a five foot gauge that was predominant in the south. And of course, this was a northern project. Uh, early on, the big four in Sacramento, uh, Crocker, Hopkins, Huntington, and Stanford, who formed the Central Pacific Railroad, were looking for money. They needed money. Uh, their goal was to build a railroad without using any of their own money. <laughs> and that comes back to bite them again later, too. Uh, so they were based in Sacramento, but they went to San Francisco and they gave a group in San Francisco the rights to build the westernmost section from Sacramento to the Bay Area. And that group formed the Western Pacific Railroad. No relationship to the Western Pacific Railroad that some of you might remember of a a couple of decades ago. Uh, and this was the charter map of the Western Pacific Railroad. This is a detail of that uh, charter map, and it's, it's quite interesting in that here's Livermore's Pass, Livermore Plains, there's Livermore's house right there, and there's this hotel. Does anybody know who the hotel was? What the hotel was? That was Lad's hotel. Alfonso Ladd was a, was a squatter on Livermore's property after Livermore died. And he built a hotel. And that was the center of what became known as Ladsville, which was actually uh, among the first towns in the valley. Okay, how did they finance the railroad? They wanted to get other people's money. How did they get other people's money? Selling bonds, selling loans, okay? This is actually a copy, no, this is a real, a copy of a real bond from 1865 for the Western Pacific Railroad that they got the county of Santa Clara to back. And so this is a thousand dollar bond. And so what they did is they sold local bonds to local business people. 
They got the federal bonds after they built each 20 mile section of track, although they had to build 20 miles. <coughs> they sold the bonds to their friends. They had to sell more bonds to pay the interest on the bonds that were already sold. <laughs> and they hoped that the future business of the railroad would pay off the debt. That also had interesting long-term consequences. Okay, so here was kind of the structure. And this was really quite a scam in those days. The railroad companies were all chartered by Congress. The Western Pacific Railroad for the western section through Livermore, the Central Pacific Railroad uh, going east from Sacramento, and the Union Pacific Railroad going west out of Nebraska, out of Omaha. Okay, now each of these railroads, the principles of each of these railroads, chartered independent companies for construction and banking. Uh, you might read that as money laundering. <laughs> uh, so what they did is the railroads contracted with these independent companies at well above cost for the construction of the railroad, which meant that there were large profits that came to these independent companies. But who were these independent companies? They were these people right here. <laughs> okay? So that all went back in their pockets. I mean, this is where Stanford and Huntington and, and the likes got all their money. This is how they got their money. Now, after the railroad was completed, Congress, uh, Congress got wind of this, and they started an investigation that became known as the Credit Mobilier Scandal. Okay, Credit Mobilier was the name of the company that the Union Pacific used. All right. By then, uh, Western Pacific Railroad actually had been absorbed by the Central Pacific and their contract and finance company, but they knew what was going on, and they burned their offices to the ground so that all their records were lost, so they couldn't be uh, couldn't be investigated. <laughs> well, anyway, the Western Pacific Railroad began construction in 1865, and the guys finished the first 20 miles, and this is a photograph of the Federal Inspection Train at the first uh, 20 miles. That wall still exists, by the way. Uh, the Western Pacific Railroad was out of funds after building the first 20 miles, and they discovered that the big four in Sacramento had completely cornered the money markets in San Francisco, so they couldn't sell their bonds. So as a result, McLaughlin, Charles McLaughlin, who was one of the principals of the Western Pacific, never paid his contractor, Jerome Cox, what Jerome Cox had spent in actually constructing the first 20 miles, and had to make a deal, wound up forcing, forced to make a deal with the Western Pacific that wound up giving the Western Pacific, the, the, giving the Central Pacific, the Western Pacific Railroad, but it gave the federal land grants to Charles McLaughlin personally. How this came about, we don't know, because that got caught up in the, in the flames when they burnt the records. Mm -hmm. However, the contract and finance company, the Central Pacific's company, completed the railroad on May 15, 1869, just five days after the Golden Spike was driven. Regular service actually began on September 6, 1869. And it began through Livermore as the Western Pacific Railroad, even though it was being taken over by the Western, uh, by the Central Pacific. Central Pacific officially took it over in June of 70. Uh, 
Another interesting thing that most people don't realize is that the Central Pacific was leased to the Southern Pacific Railroad in 1893. And it was not actually merged into Southern Pacific until June 30th, 1959. So it was actually a different railroad for the entire time that it carried passengers. And virtually the entire time it served Livermore. All right. Well, it was Whitney's China trade was the initial goal of the railroad. Tying the nation together convinced Congress to build it. Profits for the builders is what got it built. Now what? The guys that built it didn't know the first thing about running a railroad. There was no business plan. Uh, there, was, there was no apparent profits to be made. There were no customers out there. This was just empty land. So what they realized is that the land grants <coughs> were their saving. The land grants, selling the land to immigrants, to potential farmers, would create crops, create businesses that needed the railroad to take their crops to market, uh, take whatever it was they were doing to market, supply them with all of their needs. And they needed to develop commerce that required freight. Freight was going to be their profit. All right, town of Livermore. Turns out William Mendenhall uh, acquired a piece of land from the Bernal Ranchero in about 1867. I think Loretta's here, she can get exact details of what happened. It was a rather complicated deal. Quite a few people were involved. Uh, there was some horse trading. Uh, he spent about $11,900 for uh, a very substantial piece of land. And it was finally cleared in early 1869 entirely in his name. And he realized that if he could plot a town alongside the railroad, the railroad would put a station there. And this is the original plot for Livermore. Uh, this is the Ranchero line, where uh, this was uh, Livermore's Ranchero on this side, this was uh, Bernal's Ranchero on this side. Uh, and so he platted the town here, and at that time, the railroad was just a single line through. But what he did, what, what Mendenhall did was he left a space here, and he platted these first four blocks for development, for industrial development, for major, uh, major structures that would have direct connection with the railroad. Now, a couple of years later, in, okay, this was November 4th, 1869 that the plot was filed. In fact, the, uh, the signature block here gives the exact date and time, and that was the county recorder's signature. Uh, Livermore grew around the station, not Ladsville, even though Ladsville was less than a mile away. In 1869, the population of Ladsville was about 50 people. Livermore was zero. <laughs> OK, the railroad established a station agency in 1869. Initially, they just parked a boxcar nearby as an office until they could build a depot. Turns out they built two depots. They built a freight depot on the east side of uh, Bell Street and a passenger depot on the west side of Bell Street. Uh, in 1871, there was a fire that destroyed much of Ladsville, and the merchants all rebuilt around the Livermore station. 
the builder of the station, of the depot, was a guy named Arthur Brown, who was actually a fairly famous architect. Uh, his son was also a famous architect. And he designed both the original depots and what I call the modern depot, the 1892 depot, which still exists to this day. We happen to have a timetable uh, from the very first services, uh, from about the initial service. And you see we had four passenger trains a day, and it took about two hours to get into Oakland. In other words, and the way the schedules were arranged, you could go into Oakland, do some business, and be back home <coughs> on the same day. Before the railroad opened, it was at least a two-day trip to get there, and another two days to get back. There's uh, an image of one of the early trains in Niles Canyon. Okay, Charles McLaughlin personally acquired all the Western Pacific land grants. But he also claimed that much of Rancho Los Positas and Noriega's Rancho were actually uh, free property that rightfully belonged to him as federal land grant. And he had lots of money at this point, and he convinced the U.S. Land Commissioner <laughs> to uphold McLaughlin's claims. Uh, in doing so, he became the second largest landholder in California. Second only to, anybody know? Stanford, yes. <clears throat> this gives you an idea of before and after uh, the Land Commission. Uh, this was Rancho Las Positas before 1875 and after 1875. And all the rest of it went to McLaughlin. And the, both the Pacific Railroad Act and the Treaty of Hidalgo uh, guaranteed the rights of the Mexican land grant claims. So he refused the land grant claim. But by the way, he also claimed the validity of the expired 1855 uh, easement that uh, Livermore had, had sold for $5, even though they hadn't built the railroad in two years. Okay, by 1876, the town was growing, and you can see that here's the original plot. Uh, the railroad built a loop what I call a downtown loop to service these structures. There's the uh, freight depot and the passenger depot. Uh, there's Ladsville here. This is Livermore. Two additional tracks were added to the town and the population was 839 and the town was officially incorporated in 1876. The population grew rather steadily thereafter, except during the Depression, it took a, a bit of a hit back. Uh, and the hit back was a twofold hit, was one from the Depression and two from the completion of the Hetch Hetchy project. Quite a few of the people digging the Hetch Hetchy tunnels actually uh, resided in Livermore. Okay, this is uh, an early Western Pacific, Central Pacific Railroad Station book plan that shows what was in the downtown, and I've identified some of these features. This is the property line of future Livermore Avenue. Uh, interesting thing about drawings, about railroad drawings, about all engineering drawings at the time, was they were done with India ink on linen. And you didn't just do a new drawing. As things changed, you just added to the old drawing. Or you even erased stuff by scratching off the India ink. But anyway, you can see uh, there was a cattle pen 
uh, hay barn, Anspacher's uh, warehouse. Uh, there's the passenger depot and the freight depot. There was a turntable and an engine house because Livermore was important for helper locomotive service to help trains get over the Altamont. They added an extra locomotive to the train just for the climb. Okay, in 1879 things changed. Livermore was no longer on the Transcontinental Railroad because the railroad built a shorter route. This blue line, they came down through the Delta and they built a ferry boat, the ferry boat Solano, also designed by Arthur Brown, uh, to take them across the bay, uh, well, across the Cartinas. And that made the trip 75 miles shorter. In those days, when the average speed was 25 miles an hour, that meant uh, a couple of hours, actually, shorter time. Uh, the ferry trip, the ferry could <coughs> carry an entire train of 20, 20 cars, 24 cars, plus the locomotive. So the crossing was actually quite quick. And then eventually there was a bridge across the Carnegie's, the, the Venetia Bridge. Okay. McLaughlin never paid Cox for building the first 20 miles. So Cox walked into McLaughlin's office one day and shot him dead. <laughs> now, McLaughlin at that point was so hated that uh, they couldn't raise a jury. So it. And in fact, charges were dropped. And instead, he was nominated for governor. <laughs> Which he lost, by the way. But the death of McLaughlin actually opened up quite a bit of land in the valley for sale. Uh, it was McLaughlin's daughter who got much of the land, and she uh, she opened up a lot of it for sale. What? Doherty. Yeah, Doherty. Okay, so one of the things they they did to help build freight was they brought in settlers. This is an image of a settler's train and the passenger cars on this train are actually a little better than cattle cars. They had guards on them and they had a very low fare. It was $50 from New York. The regular fare was $108. Uh, the company owned the ships. They brought these people in from Europe. They gave them grub stake loans, which meant they had to go to work, raise crops, sell them, and pay back the loans. <laughs> and a lot of them had difficulty doing that, so the railroad simply foreclosed and resold the properties. Uh, quite a few times, and that was one of the main reasons for a lot of the animosity towards the railroad over the years. <laughs> the, the station was the business hub of the town. In fact, the town at that time, and literally up until World War II, was a support town for the agricultural community and the small industries that grew up here. There was brick making, uh, there was some mining, there was coal, uh, there was a matchmaking company, diamond matchmaking company. Uh, but the town was mainly a support structure for the local people and the local community. Uh, the railroad business, still, land development and freight. And when we say freight, we mean full carload freight. Uh, passengers, baggage, express, and mail never brought them enough of a profit. Never brought them a profit. Uh, the depot uh, brought through train orders from the dispatchers. 
uh, telegraph and, as I said earlier, locomotive helpers to get over the pass. Livermore's business, cattle, feed grains, wine, bricks, mining, they brought in goods and supplies, news, and gossip. The depot was kind of a center for town gossip. <laughs> it was also the first place that news came in, because it came in by telegraph even before the newspapers got there. Okay, the old depot, the old freight depot, burned on June 28, 1891. The newspapers say that this was one of the hottest days of the year. And they think the fire started when a case of gasoline exploded. But in any case, it burned the freight depot to the ground. Uh, the railroad, recognizing that Livermore was a growing, uh, growing center, designed uh, or built this depot, which was their standard design number 18, uh, also an Arthur Brown design. And this was actually modified from the standard design. They had a larger freight house and what we call a freight shed behind the freight house. This wasn't standard in the number 18 designs, but because business was so good in Livermore, they modified the design for it. So this is what the depot looked like. Uh, floor plan. There was a second story upstairs that was living quarters for the station agent and his family. And some of those station agents lived there for 20 years or more. Uh, the downstairs was all railroad. There was a passenger waiting room, the official office of the depot. Uh, there was a baggage room, and then the freight house which was actually quite large in those days, and it recovered for its shed. There were a large number of these depots built, about 61 of them. And there are still 11 remaining today. Uh, up until, what, nine months ago, none was in railroad service. Now, only Livermore's is in railroad service, again. Okay, the long freight shed. Uh, was for loading and unloading. Uh, you can see all sorts of stuff. They could put like uh, five or so boxcars out here uh, to be loaded and unloaded at any one time. Here's where the funding scheme started to get them, where it did get them. In 1893 to 96, there was a very serious depression when uh, the railroads could not pay back their bonds. They were having difficulty paying back their bonds. Uh, Huntington was forced to lease the Central Pacific Railroad to the Southern Pacific Railroad and pull some money out of his own pocket to keep it from going on. This was the first time in the entire project that he had put some money into the project. <coughs> he died in 1900, and Edward Harriman took over the reins of the railroad. Uh, Harriman was the president of the Union Pacific at the time, and of course his goal was to merge the two into a single railroad that would have the entire route from Chicago <coughs> to the West Coast. Uh, there was a certain president, a uh, guy named Teddy Roosevelt, who looked askance at this scheme and uh, decided to do what he called trust busting. And this was his first trust bust. He prevented that murder, went through the courts, and it took 15 years or so, but Harriman lost that. It was after Harriman died that uh, his sons lost the case and the railroads were broken up. Uh, 
pre-1906 images of the depot are very rare. Uh, this image, not a good quality, I copied it out of a newspaper, which was a copy, which was a lousy copy of probably a lousy image. Uh, we know it was 1901 because that was Herbert L. Hagerman at age 12. Uh, this water tank is the infamous tank that toppled during the 1906 earthquake, flooding part of downtown. Mm. By the way, you can tell it's a pre-1906 image because you see the brick chimney. The chimneys came down in 1906 and were never replaced. Instead, they put up stove pipes. There was one stove pipe. This was taken very shortly after the earthquake. Uh, that stove pipe was for the upstairs cook stove, so they kept the station agent in business. This chimney section didn't need to be replaced because it was springtime, summertime. You don't need heat in the waiting room uh, in Livermore in the summertime. So uh, Livermore was actually quite important uh, after the earthquake in San Francisco. The National Guard Company I embarked in Livermore to help fight the fire. The railroad from Livermore into Oakland was the only railroad in the entire Bay Area that remained passable after the earthquake. And many people from San Francisco actually evacuated to Livermore uh, immediately after the quake. Uh, this is also a 1906 image. You can see this temporary water tank on rather stout wooden legs. Okay, uh, Harriman still had his sway at this time, and in 1909 he decided to paint all of his depots the same colors. And they repainted the Livermore Depot uh, the colors that we see today uh, at that time. And interesting, you see in this black and white photo, the lower section looks darker. And that's a consequence of the black and white films at that time. The lower section was actually a little darker, slightly in a browner color, because it was a sand-filled paint that they used to prevent damage from these carts running into the walls and from what I called penknife graffiti. <laughs> and by the way, the color change is visible in most of the black and white photographs. And you can date the photographs from before or after the paint job because in the older color scheme, the wainscot actually looks lighter in the black and white photographs. This was an interesting photograph in 1910. A couple of interesting things happened. See this little white thing here? That's a telephone sign. That was a sign indicating there was a public telephone in the depot. It was just installed in October of that year. Also in 1910, the first competition to the Western Pacific Railroad came through. And that is what was called the modern Western Pacific Railroad, which was the railroad we remember coming through the Livermore as the second railroad. And you can see there's quite a crowd there that was uh, waiting to uh, celebrate the first train on the Western Pacific Railroad. There was a lot of excitement over the building of the Western Pacific. They thought it would ease some of the issues that the uh, Central Pacific had. Uh, there was a lot of animosity towards the Central Pacific. Their freight rates were very high. In fact, they were so high as to put 
owe about 15% of all uh, shippers out of business each year. And that was intentional by the railroad. Uh, turns out the Western Pacific Railroad didn't help the folks in Livermore very much. It was, it was the masterpiece of Jane Gould and his son George, who uh, hated Huntington. And they wanted to show him up by building a parallel transcontinental railroad. And their goal as a railroad business plan was purely long distance heavy freight and long distance passenger service. And it was really a parallel railroad. They actually crossed the Central Pacific four times in the Livermore Valley in the area. And uh, here's an image of one of those crossings. This is at the entrance to the Altamont. This was the new Western Pacific. This was the Central Pacific right there. <laughs> real, real competition, what really finally killed the railroads, began pretty much in 1913 with the paving of the Lincoln Highway. The coming of the automobile and trucking uh, really, really took a lot of the business from the railroad, especially the local business. Not so much, not so much the long distance business yet. Also notice, this is the same water tank, temporary water tank that was put up in 1906. And notice there's a spout on the back side of it. That's because there was a siding back here. Uh, in fact, there were a couple of sidings there that served businesses on the other side of the tracks. Okay, in 1917, we were at war, First World War. And the US government nationalized the entire railroad system. And that had several effects. First of all, they standardized work rules. They made the eight-hour day a standard. They tried to standardize equipment. They only built the same kind of exact same locomotive for every size. They standardized on freight rates and trackage rates. This is actually what helped relieve the situation uh, of the Central Pacific Railroad overcharging for local uh, freight rates. They actually had significant support for industrial development, which was necessary for the war effort. And but they limited the competition between railroads. In fact, they forced railroads to work together. So this was actually quite a change for the entire railroad industry. Okay, the maximum build-out service of all the railroads nationally was in the 1920s, and that goes for Livermore too. Uh, these are two drawings, station plans, uh, you can't see them, see them very well in, in this drawing. It's because they're huge. They're uh, 28 inches by 58 inches each. And they give the details of everything going on around the station in Livermore. Uh, one of the things that's quite obvious is the parallel lines. It's hard to see it in this. Uh, I've got some details coming up next. But the Western Pacific goes across here, the Central Pacific here, and on the Western Pacific you see a couple of sidings. On the Central Pacific you see a whole bunch of sidings. And what does that mean? Sidings represented services to local businesses. So you can see the difference in the amount of service 
that the, each railroad was giving to the community businesses. By the way, remember what I said about ink drawings. Uh, these were ink drawings on linen. And you can see bright areas. That's, those were all things that were erased. You can see uh, streaks here. Uh, they actually not just scraped off the ink, but they used Clorox or chlorine bleach to help remove the stuff. And that stuff ran. Okay, here's a detail of one of the sections. And this is the Western Park. Uh, this is First Street. This is S Street. Uh, this is Stanley Boulevard. Okay, and you can see a whole bunch of erasure here. That was the brickworks. You can see a line that comes across Stanley Boulevard and into the Arroyo. By the way, this is now the hospital. But you can see a fan of tracks here. This was the Kaiser Quarry. Uh, you can see they scraped so much away here they had to patch it with a mandate. Uh, this line was removed completely. That's where the engine house was. This drawing was almost completed in 1959, so it was after the end of steam. Well, here's a close-up of the middle section, and you can actually see some of the uh, Richfield oil. Uh, I think that's Diamond Match Company there. And you can see that there's uh, a cattle corral on the on the uh, Western Pacific, there was a ramp for mining of materials to be dumped into cars, uh, but not nearly the development of sidings as there was on the Central Pacific. Uh, this is from the Eastern map. There's one thing that's very important here. You see this big square erasure here. That was the time they removed the freight shed from the depot and shortened the depot. This was dated 1961. And also this, this was the eastern entrance to that downtown loop that was uh, removed earlier. By the way, if anyone is interested in looking at these in detail, I have the full resolution drawings uh, here, and we can go into any specific area that anybody's interested in after, after we finish. All right. Uh, does anybody know what street this is? It says <laughs> But recognize. Blacksmith Square? Blacksmith Square. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, there's now an undercrossing here. Here's the other railroad. Uh, this was the first crossing safety device. It was in the 1920s. It was called a wigwag. This thing on top would swing back and forth, and a bell would ring here, and a light would flash when a train was coming. Uh, there were complaints for years that the steam trains would spook the horses. And the railroad's answer was, we were here first. It's your problem. Eventually, I think the town went with the railroad to put these in. All right, by January 1941, passenger service was eliminated. Travel times never changed from 1869 to 1941. Still took two hours to get in under. You could drive it in under an hour. Uh, the population of Livermore at that time wasn't all that great. It was 20, just under 2,900 people. Uh, light trucks 
could now carry the mail, the newspapers, the milk. So what was normally carried in baggage cars was just no longer needed the service. Uh, to carry, put something on a baggage car, you had to carry it from the source to the railroad, put it on the baggage car, deliver it to the station and have somebody take it off the car. Mark the phone. Uh, you'd have to have somebody take it off the car, put it into a vehicle, a wagon of some sort, to the delivery point. By 1941, a single pickup truck would do the entire job just fine. So the railroad was really losing business. And uh, it, uh, it was the time it was the end for the passenger service. <laughs> they still had cattle coming through town, and they were driven right through town uh, to, the, to the station site where there was a cattle pen, and it could be loaded on the train cars. By 1954, look at the freight platform. It's empty. Oh, you can just see the modern water tank that was just across L Street. Uh, this was the last years of steam. Uh, 1956, all steam was ended. And actually, they brought through, this was one of the heaviest of the steam locomotives that Southern Pacific had built. This is a huge monster of locomotive. And, but all they did was run. They still needed helper service. In fact, helper service is still needed to this day. And uh, so they had, here was a diesel helper locomotive. And there was a, almost always a caboose uh, sitting next to the depot. And the caboose was the bunkhouse for the helper crew. It actually had a little kitchen in it and bunks. And it was quite a comfortable little temporary abode while you were at work. There's a helper to loose again. But notice all the grass, all the weeds. That means there just weren't a lot of trains coming through. Okay, so by late 1961 on that drawing, and into 1962, they totally changed the depot, and they changed the trackage around the depot. You can see they chopped off the long freight shed. Uh, they chopped off most of the freight platform. They just left a little section of it that could service a single box. <laughs> And they put in a little stump siding for the caboose. And what they did is that there was a third track over here to the left. And that track was removed and some of that property was deeded to the city for part of the railroad avenue project. The Livermore Depot was finally closed in February of 1971. All freight, what there was left of it, was scheduled now through Oakland. SP's goal, Southern Pacific Railroad's goal at this point, they were hurting. They were losing money right and left. They were still trying to profit by land development. And by land development now, it meant turning station properties, station sites, into strip malls. This was their modus operandi. So they wanted the depot out of there. Uh, and it set up a rather complicated battle with the city, caused the formation of the Heritage Guild, which eventually saved the depot, but not before the railroad actually started the demolition of the depot. 
uh, is pretty serious. They were three days into the process, and they had a bulldozer out. They were ready to plow it down, but the bulldozer wouldn't start. When the heritage village showed up and got in their way and blocked any further progress. However, at this point, they had completely stripped the interior and uh, did a lot of damage to the exterior as well. Okay, the railroad leased the depot to a restaurant chain and they initiated what they called a rebuild. For, they called it a restoration, it wasn't really. Uh, they rebuilt it and converted it to a restaurant. The interior was totally reconfigured. Um, much of the original historic fabric of the depot was destroyed. Uh, a lot of non-historic railroad artifacts were imported to jazz up the, the theme of the restaurant. Um, SV did go ahead with the rest of the strip mall development. We know it today, or knew it up until a couple of years ago, as the Lucky Center. Uh, and it was SP's construction of the Lucky Center that caused the demise of the restaurant. They basically blocked access to parking and access to the restaurant. It became a dusty mess. And of course, the restaurant lost patronage and went out of business. And much of that uh, was part of what they called the Railroad Consolidation Project. This was where the two railroads got together. They were actually somewhat forced to by the city of Livermore and said, OK, we don't want two separate railroads running through town a couple of blocks apart. Uh, there's room on one right of way to take both railroads, and they don't have to go through downtown. So the original railroad went through here right through Orchard Supply and Safeway, which they had already built a job around so they could build that. Uh, so they put a jog in here and took the, sent the uh, then the Southern Pacific Railroad uh, alongside <coughs> the Western Pacific Railroad tracks through town. And that project was completed by 1976. And by, by the way, this photo was taken by John Shirley. Well, I'm not sure whether it was taken by John or Steve, but they may have been in the plane together. OK, so this is when they rerouted the railroads. This was the first train over the new, the new tracks. And what it meant is that the railroad was now a block and a half, two blocks away from the depot. So the station site was now cleared for their, uh, for SP's development, except for the depot. <coughs> All right, the restaurant failed after a few years. This was a refrigerator car in the restaurant, parked next to the depot on the wrong side, of course. Uh, they added a concrete blockhouse for a kitchen. Uh, they cut through the wall here to put an exterior stairway in. Uh, they really did a lot of damage to the depot. They did build back a brick uh, chimney to what they thought the upper portion of the chimney looked like. Uh, the SP sold the station property to investors, to investors in San Francisco, a couple of lawyers, just perhaps two days before the SP went under. The SP was taken over by the Santa Fe Railroad in 1983. And again, Teddy Roosevelt's trust busting prevented that. The Interstate Commerce Commission said, no, you can't merge the Southern Pacific and the Santa Fe Railroads. 
So Santa Fe turned around and sold SP's transportation company to the Rio Grande Railroad, but they kept the properties, the property rights. And that went into a company that Santa Fe spun off called Catullus. So until 2005, that property was owned by these San Francisco investors. And any of you who ever leased space in there uh, knew who these people were. Uh, in 2005, they sold out to a developer <coughs> and to a project to build housing on the site. At that time, the developer had to borrow money for the project, and they borrowed the money, since it was a housing project, they borrowed the money from the city of Livermore's housing department. <coughs> and so they turned around, bought the property, but they too required that the depot be moved from the property. And the city council at that time, this is 2005, made the commitment to move the depot to the present ACE station. The interesting thing is, in 2007, after this developer had taken down the, the Lucky Center, the Lucky Stores, uh, came a, a bit of a recession. They went under. They couldn't pay the interest on the loan to the city. So the city foreclosed and took ownership of the property. Okay, so just to summarize, abandonment and merger, etc., left the, eventually the uh, Rio Grande Railroad was taken over by the Union Pacific Railroad. And so it's the Union Pacific Railroad finally got its wish of a connection on the Transcontinental Railroad all the way through to the Pacific. Uh, SP had filed for abandonment in 1982 of the Niles Tracy Line. However, the county of Alameda decided to acquire that property and preserve it. They gave it a road designation, preserving it for future road development, future transportation development. And in fact, that's where the Niles County Railroad is today. That's where they're talking about future development. The biggest problem is that UP's only interest is in carload long haul freight. That's their business. Look what's happened to the population of Livermore after World War II. It's gone up so far and so fast you can't even see what happened before World War II on that chart. It just took off. And what does that mean? And what's happened to the city of Livermore? We're no longer just the support organization for the local farming community. Okay, we're part of the Bay Area. We're part of the Bay Area economy, the Bay Area uh, community. And what does that mean? That means we need transportation into and around the Bay Area. Well, this population has grown so much that even the interstates are now overwhelmed, are being overwhelmed. And so there's a lot of talk about bringing back local passenger rail. But the Class 1 railroads are just not interested. Passenger rail is not profitable. It impedes freight. But they own the tracks. All right, so passenger rail service requires public or private funding from another source. An independent operator who's not part of the Class 1 railroads 
but it requires traffic rights over those railroads or entirely new rail. Well, uh, we've got a little passenger rail come through. Ace actually got trackage rights. They would like more trackage rights, but that's hard to come by. They probably won't get them. Uh, Bart is in the valley, but he didn't come to Livermore. The, the good thing about running passenger service is that it opened the door for the federal grant to move the depot back to the railroad and restore it because we were putting it back into transportation service. And that actually won us a federal grant. In order to do that, we had to remove the non-historic elements of the building. Uh, the tan ones are the non-historic elements. It's almost it's, uh, as much as the original building and then moved it from the original location down the street to the current transit center. And uh, two years ago, it got moved. And the interior was, was redesigned as a modern depot, not a restoration of the original. The original depot would not have made sense for the modern needs. And it was returned to service last August. And here's a listing of some of the future rail possibilities. Uh, the, the thing most talked about today is what they call Valley Link, which would come from Lathrop to Greenville on the original Central Pacific right-of-way. Hmm. That's going to save them a lot of money. They don't have to buy a new right away. The county owns it. Then it would come from Greenville to Pleasanton, BART, along 580. That will be an expensive section. But uh, they're talking about using lightweight rail, lightweight cars. So that's the cost of this entire project is less than would have been the cost of bringing BART to the world. There's ACE is proposing <coughs> South Valley service down uh, to Modesto and Turlock, but they need trackage rights. They need more trackage rights here through the uh, Tracy Niles Lake than I think the railroad is going to give them. They may have a solution where they couple two trains together and bring them together as one train, uh, but that's complicated. Uh, they're also talking about, there's, there's been some talk about restoring the Dumbarton Bridge, uh, the, the Dumbarton Rail Bridge. Uh, Facebook has actually come out and said, yeah, we're interested in funding that. <laughs> Uh, that might help a lot. That will help Facebook a lot because they're right there next to it. But it would also open up a direct route uh, up the peninsula to San Francisco. Single track Tracy to Niles is, is the real limit right now. It's trackage rights. Uh, Ace has said, oh well, we can move the Union Pacific over to the Niles Canyon Railway. And the Union Pacific Railroad has said, well, you know, the Niles Canyon Railway, uh, the right was designed in the 1850s and is so such a second class railroad, we don't want any part of it. Uh, the speed limit on it was never more than 25 miles an hour, and it just isn't going to serve. There's also talk about bringing high-speed rail through Livermore, I don't think that's going to happen at all. Uh, first of all, that needs an entirely new right-of-way and rail line. Secondly, the high-speed rail is not going to stop in Livermore. I mean, it's uh, Los Angeles to San Francisco or Los Angeles to Oakland. It isn't going to stop in Livermore. And more important, 
they're not going to bypass San Jose. Uh, San Jose is what, the second largest city in the state. Uh, it's going to go through San Jose, which means it's going to go through Pacheco Pass and not the Altamont. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if you've got any questions, I'll be happy to take them on at this point. And through Livermore, the one that no longer Royal Mojo to serve the quarries. I've heard it was narrow gauge maybe. It's along the way half bicycle path downtown. Uh, can you repeat the question? Yeah, could I comment on the rail line that went along the Royal Mojo to, to uh, feed the quarries? Uh, it's it actually shows up on the Here's just the start of it. This was where it diverged from the main line. And I think one of these, right here, there's a line that doesn't meet, doesn't connect with this rail. And I think that's the end of the narrow gauge line. Uh, but it was all part of the quarry and the uh, CPU, the system. There was an error. I think so, yeah. There was a narrow gauge segment of it. And I think they transferred product in this yard to the full gauge. Any more questions? Yeah. Hey, Ellen. Hey, Terry. I've always wondered uh, since Elf Street is the, the main uh, north south. Uh, Path through the city. Why did they elect to make the underpass on peace? I mean, do you know? I don't know. It's a good question. Um, you have to ask uh, any of the city councilmen from that era here. I don't know. I haven't seen any. But uh, that was a city council decision. And uh, I guess it, by that time, it was actually Livermore Avenue that was the main north south. Uh, through Street and L Street was just a little more residential. Uh, when the town was first laid out, L Street was the main drag. And uh, Lizzie Street, as they called it, more Avenue, was, was a little side street. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd just like to add a little bit for anybody who's interested. If you are interested, well, let's see, when they moved the depot, it was going to be reconstructed. Here. Yeah. And I thought that was going to be kind of interesting. So I went over there and I put a time-lapse camera on a tree focused on the depot. And then over a year, I uh, recorded the uh, construction of the reconstruction of the depot. And you can get it online on, uh, on, the, uh, on YouTube, uh, Depot, Livermore, and I forget what the word, third word is, but that's where it is. And, and it's in the depot. You can go to the depot and watch the video. Yeah, you can you can see the video in the depot itself. Yeah. Uh, do you know when uh, passenger service to Pleasanton stopped? Same day. All right. Yeah. Uh, actually. Repeat the question. Uh, when did passenger service to Pleasanton stop? Also, 1941. However. The Zephyr did stop in Pleasanton as a whistle stop, what they called a whistle stop, flag stop, yeah. And if you made a reservation in advance, they'd stop the train for you. When was the last... Um, Time the modern Western Pacific ran. Do you know what year it ended? Well, what do you mean by when it lasted? The, the railroad is still in use. It's just owned by the Union Pacific. And, uh, gee, I don't remember all that. There were so many mergers and, oh. and changes. 
Uh, Zephyr died in 1971. The passenger train okay, died in 71. Uh, but freight trains continue and continue to this day. Uh, I'm sure you're all aware that freight trains continue to rumble through town on a regular basis and almost never stop. Were the railroads 